Welcome back. Are you concerned about copper fouling in your rifle barrel? You should be because everybody is convinced that there's a problem there. I'm going to tell you that it's a lie. There is no such thing as copper fouling. Once I throw that out there, I'm going to get a lot of, I'm going to get a lot of comments. I know that, but I, I, love, I love to challenge your mind. Copper gilding metal was invented to replace tin, tin plated bullets, which were really, they, they were the hideously fouled rifle barrels. And those were, those were around the turn of the uh, 19th century. But when copper jacketed bullets were uh, designed, that, that gilding metal is a special alloy. It's, it's, not, it's not just pure copper, it's an alloy which is designed to be harder and tougher and uh, slicker. Once those were once those were designed, they remained in use for over a hundred years, and through many wars and, and minor minor skirmishes around the around the world. World War One and World War Two were fought with copper jacketed bullets, the same that you used, the same exact gilding metal that's used today. The Korean War, Vietnam. Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, all, all over the world, no matter where you go, there's, there's copper jacketed bullets. Now I've read through all the Department of Defense literature that I could possibly find online. It's all out there. Everything that, everything that the Department of Defense has spoken about with regarding uh, solvents is out there. It's, uh, it's all public information. You can download PDF files. and I. I challenge anybody to come up with one of them that, at one, that ever mentions copper fouling. The only thing they're seeking to clean is carbon. Get the carbon out of the bore, that's all, because carbon, carbon invites moisture and moisture is, is, is corrosive, so they want to get the carbon out. And the simpler solvents that will do it, the better. They, they, they landed on CLP because somebody, somebody in the Department of Defense thought it was a good idea to have a two-in-one solvent that cleaned and then lubricated. I think it's kind of a nonsensical proposition, frankly. I mean, I've used CLP. It cleaned marginally well. It cleaned okay. Um, in fact, one of the Department of Defense publications I read that was printed in 1991 said that in one, you know, one particular test, People, the, the examiners, the military examiners, were not overly impressed by its ability to clean carbon, and that's that was the whole point of it. You know, they they used they used a lot of it, and it didn't clean the carbon that well. Um, it 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 didn't it didn't do an awful lot of lubrication either, because they found that they found that in their tests that there was some there was some typical corrosion, uh, you know, during their testing. So why they're sticking with CLP, I have no idea. Uh, you know, there's a lot of government contracts that the government sticks with because, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of lobbying going on to sell products. But nobody's, nobody in the military is buying copper solvents, and they do a lot more, they do a lot more shooting than you and I do, amen? Copper filing is therefore a lie. If it doesn't exist as far as the military is concerned, and I've seen no, no evidence of it in my entire life, uh, then, it's, then it's a lie, you know. And uh, anybody, who, anybody who seeks to sell something which is based on a lie is basically take, trying to take money out of my pocket, and I'm not going to let them do that. Um, my, my personal experience, if I, if I take my rifle out, say I take my uh, 22 250 out, and uh, I, I bring with me you know, a, a, box and a, a box and a half of ammo to test, you know, various loads or something like that. I may, I may fire, you know, 60 rounds in the course of a day and uh, say, you know, that's, that's like three boxes of ammo. And uh, I won't clean the gun during the course of the testing. So very frequently, the, the, most, accurate, the, the most accurate loads tend to be the, the top end loads. And the top end loads are the last ones that I shoot. And so that, you know, if, if, I, if, if my groups are getting smaller as I'm shooting the top end loads toward the end of my testing session, what is that telling you? Is that telling you that there's no such thing as copper fouling? That copper fouling is not somehow interfering with my shooting process? 
whether I do it with my 270 or my 300 Winchester Magnum, whatever, whatever rifle it is, I have not experienced any copper fouling. I've experienced copper in barrels, absolutely. That's not copper fouling, it's a big difference. When a drywaller, you know, is finishing a wall after it's been after the drywall has been screwed up to the studs, you know, he takes his he takes his mud with a six inch trowel and he goes around and he wipes he wipes every one of those screw holes and he goes back and he does that successively uh, two more times. So three more th over three times, uh, he has taken that screw hole, uh, that, that dent in the wall with the black screw in it, with the Phillips screw, and he is in three in three passes over three days, he's completely filled it in and it's nice and smooth. And that's what happens with your rifle when you buy a brand new rifle and it happens to have a rough bore. And if it's not if it's not a cold hammer forged rifle bore, it is rough. It it looks like it looks like intersecting uh, railroad tracks because you've got the top of the lands have got perpendicular striations from the twirling of the uh, drill that, that bored the hole down through the barrel. And then you've got the longitudinal striations that occur when the, the broach hook was pulled down the barrel to scrape the rifling in. And even if it was even if it was a, a, a broach, a button broach rifle where the where the button is displacing the metal and pulling pulling it down the bore, then you're going to have just straight longitudinal cuts of both the tops and the tops of the lands and the and the grooves. Those those striations they, they they look pretty shiny when you're looking down the barrel. You don't see them, but if you if you were to slice your barrel into into two and take a microscope to it, you'd you'd see very very uh, pronounced striations that are there. Believe me, that's that's why that's why you know at a police forensic laboratory they can examine a bullet and match the bullet to the the barrel that it came from because the striations of this in the in the uh, bullet. So when you have, when you have a uh, fresh rough bore, I'll call it a rough bore if it's a brand new barrel like that, and you fire the first few rounds down through that bore, it, you're doing exactly the same thing as the drywaller does when he fills in those screw holes. But it doesn't continue to build up. It, it doesn't, just, just like the drywaller could go back and he could, he could repeatedly take mud and wipe it on that same place for the next 10 years and it's not going to build up on top of it. It's not going to, it's not going to turn into a mound because the mud's not going to, it's not going to collect on anything. There's nothing there for it to fill in. So it, it, the, the knife blade will just simply wipe over it and he has mud on the floor where it just falls because there's nothing, there's nothing to, it, uh, to adhere to. And that's the same thing that happens with bullets. The first few bullets that go down the barrel fill in those striations and those imperfections and it causes a nice smooth, smooth glass surface. And that is the whole, that's the whole reason why people find that, you know, breaking in a bore by firing a number of rounds will improve its accuracy because they're creating a smooth bore. Now I don't buy into, I've spoken about this before, I don't buy into the nonsense of this alternating pattern of firing, you know, so many rounds and then cleaning and firing so many rounds and cleaning. You know, the carbon in the bore doesn't interfere with the process of the plating. The metal, the metal plates the bore and that's the end of it. Uh, and it doesn't take very many shots to do it in my estimation. I think it's done in the first three or four shots. I've never seen, I've never seen a barrel get, mar it, it, it shoots accurately to begin with and just continues to shoot accurately. Um, some of my some of my best some of my best groups were shot with the absolute brand new barrel that had never been shot before except for the the test firing at the at the uh, factory, which tells me that maybe the test firing at the factory successfully filled in those uh, striations. So, if if that's the if that's the status with with my rifle, it should be the status with your rifle. I have a lot of I've. I've owned a lot of rifle barrels over the years, and they've all been supremely accurate. You'll never find me putting any kind of copper copper so-called copper fouling solvent down a barrel. I don't want to remove that nice plating that I've accumulated in there. 
I certainly don't want to use a caustic substance that if it's so if it's so strong that it can attack copper. Copper is used in your house, you know, to for your water pipes. And it and it stays there for year after year after year without without breaking through and deteriorating because it won't rust. Steel rusts and you know it, it breaks down. And I'm not going to use something if it if it's strong enough to break down copper, it's certainly strong enough to attack steel. And I'll testify that I, I had three rifle barrels go on me uh, almost overnight because I began using a very caustic copper removing solvent in my dumb and stupid days. And uh, I, bought into the con I bought into this concept that uh, copper fouling was uh, a problem. And why, I don't know, because I had been shooting accurately right along. But somebody at one of these bench rest matches one day uh, he was he was using a he was using a product and he's pushing it down the bore and everything, and um, then one day uh, my brother-in-law and I were out the range and um, he was cleaning his bore with the same solvent, and uh, I'm not going to mention the name because I'm not I don't want to have somebody you know sign a lawsuit against me. But uh, he had this uh, he had the same bottle of so he was using my bottle of solvent, and. Um, he was doing his bore about the third time, you know, after he was doing it after every, after every group that he fired. And he did it until he had clean white patches come out and everything. So he was following this process. All of a sudden, he, he looked at me and said, oh, no, look at this. His, his bronze bristle bore brush, his, his beautiful bronze bristle bore brush was completely bald. It had no more bronze bristles in it because all the bristles had basically disintegrated. All he had was the twisted wire where the, the bristles used to be. Um, that kind of got my concern because I realized that this is, this is some powerful stuff. And uh, about a year after that, I noticed that uh, my, my barrel, my two, my two 270 barrels were seriously uh, damaged. Um, and, I, and I attributed it to that solvent. I had never used that solvent before that, and I had never used that solvent since. And I've never had any problems with barrel deterioration beforehand, and I never had any problems with barrel deterioration since. I blame it on that solvent, and for very good reason, because it was highly, it was highly corrosive. So stay away from those solvents. That's my, that's my supreme advice to you. Take care of your rifle barrel. You don't need to be using any, any caustic solvents. You don't need to remove copper. You don't want to remove the copper. You want to leave it in there. It's nice and smooth. It's not going to, it's not going to continue to build up any more than a, a nail hole is not going to con continue to build up. So leave it at that. And for all my Patreon donors, thank you so much for your kind support and uh, your, your monetary support. I'm checking the weather daily. The, the, we, you know, we're, we're st I'm still waking up to, to 19 to 20 degrees. And, uh, you know, by the time by the time it's warm enough where your fingers aren't going to freeze out at the range, uh, it's, it's already close to, you know, mid afternoon. So I've really got to I've, I've really got to wait until uh, I can't get out to do any shooting until uh, after it warms up a little bit more. So I, I would suspect I would suspect in the next week or two things should start getting a little bit better. If I can get out by if I can get out by yeah, say, you know, ten o'clock or eleven o'clock or something like that, that's that's good. I can I can uh, pack up and, and get out then. But uh, it's certainly too cold out there right now to and especially with so much snow out there, even if the ambient temperature of the year is in the is in the high thirties. Yeah, the the snow is creating is is creating an awful lot of uh, cold air close to the close to the shooting bench, which is in the dark. It's in the shade, so uh, it, it's very very uncomfortable. And I can't. I just can't. Uh, my my extra mites, my extremities, simply won't uh, deal with that. But anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Please hit that sub subscribe button and the bell, and. Um, Stay tuned. I'll have many more topics to talk about. God bless.